The TikTokification of the beauty industry has made it so that there are constantly new trends to keep up with. We're almost all the way through 2024, so I'm going to explore some of the beauty trends I've seen this year, how I feel about them as it relates to their impact on culture, and two trends in particular I think everyone should be cautious of, leading me to question, what's going on with these beauty trends? I'm going to start with the trend I think will be the most divisive, and it's thin eyebrows. The 90s beauty redux is evident everywhere from TikTok to Paris Fashion Week, where earlier this year, makeup artist Pat McGrath painted the finest of curves lines high on the model's forehead for the Maison Margiela show, concealing their natural eyebrows below. Then in May, the Met Gala was awash with barely bare brows, with Zendaya, FKA Twigs, and Doja Cat each opting for either bleached out or wafer thin styles. Interestingly, eyebrow fashion dates all the way back to ancient communities like the ancient Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans, and the trends tend to shift between thick and thin styles. For example, in the Middle Ages, women used to pluck their eyebrows thin to create the illusion of an elongated forehead and a blank face, which was supposed to draw attention to their decolletage and signal beauty and intelligence. During World War II, women preferred a thicker, more natural style because beauty routines were seen as a frivolous activity. And based on the amount of angry comments I saw on TikTok about thin brows, I think it's a pretty unpopular opinion to say that I actually love them. I think they're a vibe. I think they're a really fun way to change up your look. I mean, brows frame your face, so changing just your brows can make a huge impact on your overall appearance. And I know that 90s and Y2K trends are quite polarizing altogether, but having lived through both of those periods, I personally find it rather nostalgic. The general consensus is that thin brows make you look older and more feminine, and thick brows make you look more youthful and more masculine, as demonstrated here on Nina Dobrev. I actually prefer her thin brows and I never realized how much I loved that look until I started doing research for this video. I was somewhat surprised to learn that the brow industry in the United States is a $180 million business, so it's very lucrative. And when I think of present day public figures that are known for their thin brows, I think of Gabrielle, the model. She encompasses several current trends right now, like brat core, club brat, dark under eye circles, 90s thin brows, you know, kind of grungy makeup. All of those things have been really trendy this year. I also think of Mina Lei, who's a video essayist here on YouTube. She has such a unique style that I love. And I think her very arched thin brows make her so memorable, feminine, and avant-garde. Influencer Sydney Carlson also changed her brow style to a straight thin brow for a totally different look. But it's not just models and influencers. A lot of celebrities have gone for the really thin brow look this year. When I look at these pictures, I just really appreciate that you can almost play with gender expression just by changing your brow shape and style. But the thin brow icon to me is Pam Anderson in the 90s with her smoky eyes and her nude lips and her super full hair. That look was really synonymous with sex appeal. So growing up in the 90s, everybody wanted to pluck their eyebrows super thin. And when I was growing up, my mom had two rules. Don't pluck your brows and don't get a tattoo. Tragically, I went to a benefit brow salon and they plucked my poor eyebrows within an inch of their life. And looking at the pictures, I think if it were more elongated, it probably could have worked, but it took me a full three years before my brows even grew back again. And so after that, I never let anybody touch my brows ever again. So my only warning is if you do wanna participate in the thin brow trend, there is a risk that your brows won't grow back at all. Alternatively, you could try blocking half of your brows like this tutorial. In this tutorial, I'm gonna show you how to recreate that perfect skinny 90s brow but without the commitment of over plucking your eyebrows. So you'll be doing that using the Isamere Beauty brow gel, some prosade and a splattering freckle technique to disguise the real brow. Or you could rely on a trusty old TikTok filter if you just want to see what you look like. Curiosity got the best of me so I played with some TikTok filters and I have to say I actually really like the thin brow look on me and I'm a little bit tempted now to at least shape my brows or thin them out a little bit. Maybe I would get less critical comments too. People find my eyebrows very polarizing and so I don't know maybe I need to trim up my look a little bit. Talk me out of it. Please talk me out of it. I don't know I'm looking at these TikTok filters and the thin brow one looks I don't know looks pretty good. They even have a Pam Anderson filter so you can and see what you would look like with her iconic makeup with the smoky eye and the thin brow. I just really appreciate that in today's current climate, we have so much more creative freedom to express ourselves. We can wear our eyebrows however we want. Previous generations, everybody looked the same. So I may be alone in this, but I personally just find it incredibly fascinating how much power your brows have to lift or lower your eyes, to make you look more feminine or masculine, older, younger, more modern versus more retro. And honestly, I think the millennials who keep telling the younger generations not to touch their brows should just keep their opinions to themselves. Everybody has a right to make their own mistakes and learn from them or to just 
express themselves the way that they want. And continuing with the brow theme, bleached brows have been really huge this year. And I also love that look, especially because it's really easy to dye your brows again if you wanna change up your look. It's not quite as permanent as, you know, thinning out your brows by plucking them. I think bleached brows are a great trend because having a blank canvas like that allows all of your other features to really pop. And this seems to be another really unpopular opinion because I was looking on Reddit and everybody was just trashing the bleached brow trend. And when I was thinking about bleached brows, I couldn't remember off the top of my head what what celebrities or influencers had gone for that look. But when I looked it up, I was actually surprised by how many women had done it. This InStyle article mentions that the beauty trends are really pulling away from the clean girl aesthetic and moving into more messy, edgy styles and bleached brows really fall into that category. I think there's a confidence factor to it. It feels like a bold, badass choice to me. So I love it. And you know, you could participate in this trend if you have a really dark, heavy brow bone and you wanna lighten up your other features. I just think that people are way too bothered by other people's brows and decisions for their face and body and I think that's weird. The next trend seems pretty harmless on the surface but I actually think it's quite damaging and so I really wanted to talk about it today. With the rise in popularity of no makeup makeup or just more minimal makeup looks in general, especially at the start of the pandemic, came the trend recently of makeup blindness. And if you're not familiar with it, it's a social media trend where people look back on their makeup mistakes like, huge false lashes, unblended contour, thick drawn on eyebrows, you know, big lip filler, too much blush, you name it. It's all about publicly and collectively perceiving our flaws. Now this seems harmless at first, but I think that social media users really need to pay attention to the potential psychological effects of this trend. It became so viral, it expanded to people recording videos of their faces, asking their audience to tell them what they may be blind to right now, and then people got so comfortable giving others feedback that audiences en masse started giving content creators unsolicited advice, even going so far as to bully them in the comments about their looks when they weren't asked for any feedback at all. I hate to tell you this, but I think you have eyebrow blindness. What is eyebrow blindness? I'm Googling. Oh. No, I don't. I don't. Oh, come on. I don't. Well, well, well. You guys have bullied me into doing what you want. I left the house today with not putting anything on my eyebrows, just clear eyebrow gel and like brushing them up. It's the end of the day, so they're like a little unstuck. But listen, guys, I haven't thinned them out yet and I'm not gonna dye them a lighter shade. I think that we as a society have gotten far too comfortable sharing our opinions, especially ones that can really hurt someone's feelings. I personally love looking back on makeup trends from my life and laugh at how silly they seem. I mean, in some of these pictures, it is just hilarious to see like the thin eyebrows, the heavy, heavy, brutal tans, the black eyeliner in my waterline with pretty much nothing else on my eyes. I mean, these are things that we look back on and objectively they don't look great, but I don't regret anything in these photos. I mean, it's a real time capsule and it's such a great memory of my life. When I look at these photos, I know exactly what time period it was because of the style. And other times it feels like this trend is kind of a cry for validation when people are aware that they look literally perfect. Mecca's makeup education manager, Hannah Daniel says, but there's something undeniably insidious about the way the beauty blindness trend itself has evolved. From a place of simple curiosity and even humor about our own less than perfect makeup techniques, it has ultimately invited a judgmental and overly critical audience into our beauty routines. We shouldn't need to tell you why asking groups of strangers to point out our flaws is clearly dangerous territory. As Daniel points out, the best makeup looks, including the bold and glamorously noticeable ones, are quite simply the ones that make you feel confident. Others be damned. And besides, aren't fashion and beauty trends the biggest indicator of the time period? I mean, what would life and culture look like if we were all just blank canvases because we were all too scared to express ourselves and be criticized by our peers. Harper's Bazaar says, regrettable beauty choices can mark an era. We know a 1920s look because of the finger waves and Cupid's bows, from the 50s because of the coiffed hair, and from the 60s because of the eyeshadow and lashes. We recognize looks from the 80s because of the oversized volume, and from the 90s because of the muted tones and skinny brows. We remember the 2000s because of the frost and hair poofs, and the 2010s because of the lash extensions, bob, and matte lips. And who doesn't love that? I mean, take this picture of me teasing my hair. I can tell exactly what year that was because it was when everybody was teasing their hair and doing the little snooky poof. 
that was me in college. Or this picture of me at my senior prom. I can tell that I was in high school because all we ever wore was black eyeliner all over our eyes. Or this picture of me in the white dress where I am absolutely sunburnt to a crisp and my brows are plucked super thin. I know that's in my late high school, early college years. Contrasted by this yellow sweatshirt picture, I had on a bold, dark matte lip, thick, heavy brow, and I had an Instagram filter on my picture, clearly. So that puts me around 2016. Or take this picture of me in the white bodysuit. I can tell that that was 2015 because I'm wearing false lashes. And that was when like the Kylie Jenner makeup look was really big and she was wearing false lashes and a lot of lip liner. And that was what we were all emulating. So I don't look at these pictures and think, oh, I had brow blindness. Oh, I had tanner blindness. Oh, I had eyeliner blindness. All I think about when I see these pictures are an appreciation for my former self and truly a fondness and a nostalgia for these different makeup looks and these different beauty choices. And I think that if we're criticizing each other for all of those, we're gonna lose everything that makes us us in everything that gives us character. We're gonna become so monotonous. We're not even gonna be able to tell each other apart anymore. And where's the fun in that? It is so boring to me. But of course, I had the luxury of growing up without social media, without the immense judgment that kids today face on a daily basis trying to fit in or just trying to avoid getting bullied. So I enjoyed this trend from creators who are looking back fondly on their quote unquote makeup mistakes or those who are confidently displaying pride in their choices and like don't care what the internet thinks at all. But shaming people or asking for critical feedback to nitpick every single feature and every single perceived flaw feels highly unnecessary and like another reason yet again to put women down and make them feel insecure about themselves. And I deeply worry that with 27.47% of TikTok users being under the age of 18, we are not allowing those kids to have their messy phase where they can look silly and they can make mistakes in a somewhat safe space, where they can get too drunk and make stupid decisions without having to worry about ending up in a viral TikTok video that permanently damages their reputation. Because isn't growing and learning really all just a reaction to failing in the first place? And Harper's Bazaar agrees with me. I'm here to argue that you should never feel remorse or shame for experimenting with your look. You simply cannot learn about yourself without making a few beauty blunders along the way. We've all been there. So I think we should embrace our blindness. We should lean into our choices and do what makes us feel best in the moment, regardless of what other people think. For example, I put this eyeliner today knowing that a lot of people really hate it. And you know what? I don't care. I like it. And that's all that matters. These are the things we reminisce about with our friends and family. Like, oh my God, how skinny our jeans were. How dark was our eyeliner? It made us look like our eyes were so small. Those things keep us connected to our memories and to our generation. Trends are all connected and we're all connected by the beauty choices that we make day to day. For better or worse, contemporary standards of beauty are a sign of community and offer a sense of belonging. So let's laugh at ourselves and give us the grace of bold choices and so-called mistakes. I gotta say, I was pretty surprised when I saw the dark under eye circle trend. As women, we have spent so much time and energy trying to prevent and get rid of dark circles. It actually almost felt infuriating that they're trying to make them cool. But I like this trend with some very important caveats. I've always noticed the cool factor of the dark under eye circle makeup looks. It's effortless. It shows you don't really care. You may have stayed out late the night before and slept in your makeup. It's all very rock and roll. To quote makeup artist Carol Rodriguez, in the same way I don't know anyone who wears wired bras anymore, a super bright under eye feels a bit overdressed. And I totally agree with that. The bright under eye concealer of 2015 and 2016 just does not really stand up today. But let's watch a few of these videos. And what's noticeable to me is that the purposeful dark under eye makeup does not actually look like what dark circles look like in real life. Whether they're adding makeup under their eyes to look darker or they're just not putting coverage there, it's notable that these women look absolutely stunning, but the dark circles just really don't look that dark to me at all. And it's not surprising that most of the women participating in the trend are extremely young, usually white, and really do not have hereditary dark circles. I think part of this trend is great because it's all about embracing your natural skin and wearing less makeup and being confident in that and turning that into a cool factor. But I think this really leaves behind people of color, tired moms, and especially women with mature skin who probably would not be perceived as cool if they abandoned concealer in the same way. White people forget that women of color come ready-made looking different to them and that it's normal for us all to have different features. This ingrained point of view comes as no surprise considering the standardization of Western culture and beauty ideals in mass media go as far back as the 1920s, way before TikTok and Instagram existed. I'm sure there are some of you who are watching this right now who struggle with dark circles and you're like, oh, come 
on. This is ridiculous. So it's a trend that I like in theory, but is somewhat problematic in reality. On the surface, it seems like the no concealer movement is here for self-acceptance, but dig a little deeper and it clearly glorifies natural beauty, which feeds into pretty privilege. It implies that a slightly dark under eye is stylish, but a deeply dark circle is still undesirable. Put simply, this trend forgets about women of color. Rather, it is dictated by those with fair skin who would forget that by declaring their dark circles cool, ours seem even more unpalatable in comparison. This makes us feel like we need to cover up, except with what? Because concealer is no longer in favor. Often, women like me are stuck in a catch-22 dilemma where we're destined to feel unworthy and ugly never quite pretty enough for the world we live in. When I first read that, it brought a tear to my eye. I mean, it's a really sobering quote, and it made me think differently not only about this trend, but especially about pretty privilege in general. And I mean, I could go into that in a whole separate video. And I'm not alone in my feelings about this. Unsurprisingly, the internet responded to this trend pretty much exactly the way you'd think it would. Having the eye bags is a makeup trend? I have eye bags because I can't sleep at night, but okay, no sleep club. The super bright high coverage concealer look where we would just stripe that concealer in a triangle under our eyes was really never my thing. I always thought it looked really unnatural and stark. So basically for my whole adult life, I've been putting a matte brown shadow on my lower lash line and I never really knew why until I read this quote from Allure. The natural peaks and valleys that appear when light is cast on the face is what makes it unique and beautiful. And I think people are beginning to understand that covering up all of the natural darkness underneath the eye can have the same visual impact as overdone under eye filler. So it makes sense why shadows technically look good under the eyes, but I also feel like there's a difference between embracing your natural dark circles and actually applying dark makeup to achieve that look. Either way, I think it's a big change for us and my fellow millennials probably need a little bit of time to process this trend, but I think embracing natural beauty is always a step in the right direction in theory, as long as everybody is truly included. To quote Carol Rodriguez again, it's a sign that people's focus when it comes to beauty is shifting away from the manufactured perfection that's been expected of us by capitalism and is shifting toward personalization and authenticity. And I, for one, can get on board with that. The next trend that I've seen absolutely everywhere nonstop is sunset blush. And if you're not familiar, sunset blush is when you try a few different bright colors and a highlighter on your cheek at the same time to create a gradient effect that kind of mimics the sunset. Alyssa Janae started the trend in April with one of her TikToks and then it just spread like wildfire. I think this looks absolutely amazing on Alyssa because of the way she tied it into her top. The hair is pulled back so it really showcases the sunset blush on her cheeks. The way she did it, it feels both creative and also wearable. So I think this is a fun and lighthearted trend for a slightly more editorial or creative look. Allure says, unlike the sunburnt blush trend or the après ski blush look, this blush trend doesn't copy something your face could do naturally. So I think this is a trend that you would do for more of a statement look rather than something super natural on a day-to-day -day basis, especially because it uses a minimum of three colors, if not four on your face. So it's not super practical for day-to-day. -day. I think it's a little bit more of an Instagram trend. I just don't see anybody doing this in real life. It feels like it exists solely for social media engagement and participating in viral content. So I don't think it has any real longevity in the beauty space. And not every beauty trend has to be serious and move the needle forward and changing culture and society. You know, sometimes it's fun to just join in on the latest viral trend and maybe use your products in different ways than you would before. It's a fun little trend where people can try the products that they have to create a gradient look and have fun. And I have absolutely no problem with that but there's always the chance that consumers see this trend and then they go out and they buy like three or four separate products just to achieve this look. And this is probably a passing fad. So I'd say it's a great trend as long as you're using what you already have. What I will say though, is I've seen a lot of people doing this trend on Instagram and they just put a bunch of dots on their face with different colors and they blend it all together and they miss the fact that it's actually supposed to be a gradient look. So, I actually really dislike this trend because I got so burned out on it, constantly seeing it on my Instagram feed with almost everybody doing it the wrong way. So if you do wanna try it, I would follow these makeup artist tips. Make sure to blend each shade individually first. I like using a damp beauty sponge because you can use all the sides, easily rotating it to not mix one color into another. 
Once each color is blended, you can use a brush to soften the edges and then blend the shades. What I will say is I think the sunset blush trend looks particularly great on richer skin tones and more minimal makeup, like on Alyssa Janae or creators like Morella Koala. While I don't think this trend has any real longevity, I do think it's a fun excuse to kind of play with your makeup collection and use it in different ways. One of the biggest trends I've seen this year is color analysis. If you aren't familiar, color analysis is a method for determining which colors complement a person's skin tone, eye color, and hair color. It's also known as personal color analysis, seasonal color analysis, or skin tone matching. You know how certain colors seem to wash us out whereas other colors make our features pop? That's where color analysis comes into play. Using your season can help you make choices that work with you, not against you. I'm not gonna get into the weeds of color analysis because I am the last person on the planet who should be giving people advice about color theory, but I did get my color analysis done recently and I have some thoughts on the trend overall after my experience. So according to my color analysis, I'm either a light spring or a bright spring and my skin is neutral to warm, which is in direct contrast to the years of makeup artists who have been telling me that I have slightly cool undertones to my skin. So now I'm just more confused than ever, frankly. Apparently my best colors are a bright neutral red Red, a bright neutral blue, a cream or ivory, and light peach. And they also said that I look pretty good in navy and tan. They said that I look best in makeup that's glossy or sparkly versus matte. I look best in really bright lipstick shades and blush colors, nothing too brown, dark, or muted. And I can wear silver, gold, or diamond jewelry equally. I'm quite high contrast. I look best in warm clothes and makeup. And my worst clothing color is gray or anything really dark or muted. So armed with this knowledge, I purchased some red and blue tops on TikTok shop and I decluttered some fancy lipsticks. And now every time I wear a color that's not within my season, I'm just acutely aware of the fact that it's not my best shade. And I, I kind of wish that I could tune that out. And that can be the problem with color analysis. If you're prone to stressing about what other people think, if you're somewhat insecure, or if you're just really easily influenced by other people's opinions, it may be something that you just wanna skip. So I think it can be a great way to understand the colors that make you really stand out and pop. But I've also seen people obsess over their color analysis results to the point where they're throwing out tons of clothes and makeup and jewelry, and they're only buying or keeping what fits strictly within their season, and then buying all new products that align with their color analysis results, which could be very expensive and wasteful. This feels extremely restrictive to me and it can definitely limit our self-expression if we allow it to. I think it's a great tool for people who struggle to develop their own personal style and just have no idea where to start with clothes and makeup, or it's great as a guide for a little bit of inspiration. So now I just use it as a tool to look for clothes in my best shades, but I don't really let it dictate anything else because at the end of the day, I'm the kind of person who wears mostly black, white, gray, tan, and that's probably not gonna change. One of the most ridiculous trends that I've seen recently is iPhone face. And according to Urban Dictionary, iPhone face is the face of an actor who is playing a character in a period piece, but it has a modern looking face. Like they would know what an iPhone is. For example, oh my God, the cast of Daisy Jones and the Six all have iPhone faces. And this is one trend that actually didn't start on social media. According to NSS Magazine, the first case that can be traced back to and on which several online sources agree is in 2019, when a Twitter user said that Timothy Chalamet and Lily Rose Depp were miscast in the historical film, The King, set in the Middle Ages, precisely because both had faces that seemed aware of what an iPhone was. Over time, the expression has also been used for Dakota Johnson and Emma, Florence Pugh in Little Woman, Millie Bobby Brown in Enola Holmes and Damsel, Nicole Kidman in The Northman, Matt Damon in The Last Duel, or the entire cast of Rings of Power. But what makes an iPhone face? What is it about certain features that just seem modern? Is it the way we groom and style ourselves, like our brow shape and white teeth? Is it Botox and filler or other procedures indicative of the time? Or is it something else? To quote the Daily News, teeth whitening, plastic surgery, body piercings, weight training, healthful eating, and yoga have made it a challenge to find the perfect period performer. Add the unforgiving nature of high definition video on which more movies are made and seen and the emergence of visually savvy audiences, and you often have a recipe for historical dissonance. This has led to TikTok creators posting videos of themselves asking if they have an iPhone face, continuing the cycle of unnecessary feedback and opinions on ourselves and our physical appearance. Clearly this is a trend that just has very little substance or longevity, but my God, do we really need a name for everything? I'm, 
I'm just so tired. Do we really have to analyze every single thing about us to shreds? This creator posted about her iPhone face and got some of the most hilarious but brutal responses possible. And I'm so glad to see that she's been a great sport about it. It just feels like yet another reason to put women down and make them feel insecure about themselves and analyze every single thing about their bodies and their faces. The thing that makes women especially look different from generation to generation is hair and makeup. And of course, fashion. And then for men, it's kind of just fashion and maybe like facial hair and like haircuts. You know how sometimes you're watching like a TV show and it's supposed to be like historic and there's that one person has lip injections and fillers in their face and it just doesn't look right? Or even with all the Victorian makeup, they just still look too modern. That is an iPhone face. Because if you're told you have an iPhone face, then the implication is that you look unnatural. And if you don't have an iPhone face, then the implication is that you're ugly. Either way, I just don't think we need to be asking ourselves these questions. Let's move on to a fun one, Brat Core. As a fan of Charlie XCX's since 2013 and someone who's seen her in concert more than five times, I'm thrilled about Brat Summer and the global success of her album. Honestly, it's about damn time that everybody recognized the sheer brilliance of Charlie XCX. But what is the Brat aesthetic? It's messy, it's unapologetic, it's unbothered, it's DIY, bold, effortless, kind of trashy. It's all about being the kind of girl who stays out too late past the point of being cool and just not taking yourself too seriously. Quite like luxury, but yes. it can also be like so like trashy, uh -huh. just like a pack of cigs and like a Bic lighter. Yes. And right. like a strappy white top. Yeah. With no bra. Yeah. That's like kind of all you need. I'm loving the shift away from the clean girl aesthetic and the that girl trend toward a more authentic and individualized trend. All things slime green form the foundation of the trend, which further encompasses grunge attire, moody gray color schemes, deconstructed textures, and smudged eye makeup. Consider mob wife the party and brat core the bleary eyed morning after. Now, Charlie XCX has pretty much always had this aesthetic and personality, so what kicked it off? It was actually her controversial choice of album cover that launched a phenomenon. Charlie admitted to Vogue Singapore, I wanted to go with an offensive, off-trend shade of green to trigger the idea of something being wrong. So Brat Core has been described as anti-fashion or even ugly, a major shift away from the pretty, tidy, minimal looks throughout the pandemic. And not only am I a huge fan of Charlie XCX, but I'm actually a really big dance music fan. I love festivals, I love concerts, I love raves. I've had my fair share of club rat years and I find that the place I feel most authentically me is at a concert or a dance music show. So I am 100% on board with this trend and the empowerment that you feel when you embody the brat lifestyle because when you're in that kind of an environment, there's such a beautiful feeling of individuality and acceptance. You just, you can't help but love. So I think that this is less of a trend more of a state of mind and a cultural shift and one that I really hope is here to stay. The next trend is certainly not intentional. It's a byproduct of too much filler and it's called pillow face. You've probably seen pillow face among celebrities, but you may not have known that there's an actual term for it now. Pillow face is a term used to describe a puffy or pillowy appearance that can occur when too much filler is injected into the face. If for some reason you wanna know what you look like with pillow face, there are actually filters for that. And I think I'm good. I think it's a hard pass. Now, I certainly don't wanna shame people who have pillow face, but I figured I'd include this trend to raise awareness of the potential side effects of filler, as there are more and more studies coming out that raise some concerns. When I think about beauty and what makes someone stand out to me as memorable, most of the time I don't think of a super filled Instagram face or like an Instagram model. I usually think of someone who looks more natural and might have really interesting features that make them super unique or give them character. And what the widespread trend of filler has been doing is just making everybody look the same and in some cases, not even human. I've been saying for a really long time that this female obsession with cosmetic procedures shows that we're not in a good place and finally people are acknowledging something's wrong because women don't really look like human beings anymore and they're calling it pillow face. Pillow face refers to this new trend where hundreds of thousands of perfectly beautiful, healthy women in trying to become even more beautiful, even more perfect, are literally disfiguring their faces with filler. When the architecture of the human face is even slightly tweaked or pushed out of its natural boundaries, it's acutely noticeable to the human eye, says plastic surgeon, Dr. Subio. And to be clear, this doesn't just happen in women. Take a look at some of these male celebrities who seem to have a little bit of pillow face. It must be really upsetting as an actor to feel the immense pressure to stay young and look perfect in the face of endless scrutiny, only to resort to filler and then suddenly become someone that you don't even recognize and then have a problem significantly more frustrating and attention-grabbing 
than just looking like yourself, but slightly older. I'm sure when your face is your money maker, these types of aesthetic issues could probably cost you a lot of jobs. So to me, is it really worth erasing some lines on your face if you don't even look like you anymore? I mean, unless that's your goal, but I think most people still wanna look like themselves, just more youthful. Thanks to Dr. Cami Parsa's MRI scan that went viral on TikTok, we now know that filler doesn't actually fully dissolve, it just moves around. And now, not only that, but it's hydrophilic, meaning it loves water, so it actually expands in the face. So what you're looking at here is an MRI image of a 33-year-old patient who had over 12 cc, just 12 syringes of hyaluronic acid filler injected to her face over the past six years. Now the area that is green is the hyaluronic acid filler. Now what's interesting here is that when we did volumetric analysis, that means when we measured the amount of filler, the amount of volume that was there, it ended up being close to 28 cc, which is more than twice the amount of filler that was injected. And what this shows us is that hyaluronic acid fillers are hydrophilic. That means they love water and they also cause tissue expansion. And just because you have filler does not mean that you'll experience this. I don't wanna cause like a ton of fear here. So many people have been getting filler for years and they don't experience any of these problems. Based on the research I did, it seems like there's very little standardization in the industry and that can lead to patients getting over injected, patients getting injected into the wrong tissue plane. And those problems are what cause the pillow face effect. That's why it's so important to go to a reputable provider and likely not the cheapest option, especially because the American Society for dermatologic surgery found that 41.1% of practitioners have encountered counterfeit injectables and 39.7% have had patients who've had adverse reactions to them. So now we know that filler doesn't actually dissolve fully in the body. It actually continues to expand. But now even more concerning, studies are coming out that filler can, not always, but can block the lymphatic system. Although it is more common after multiple treatments, this can happen with just one treatment. We wanted to investigate to see if fillers can block the lymphatics, which is your body's natural plumbing system. The answer was yes. What we were looking at is an imaging study that maps the lymphatics using a fluorescent dye. The patient received two syringes of HA fillers or tear troughs in the face more than five years ago. On a typical person without fillers, the fluorescent dye would disappear within 24 hours. However, she still displayed fluorescence for four to five days, signifying blocked lymphatics. To put it in super basic terms, if filler blocks or damages important lymphatic channels in the face, it may actually interfere with the immune system's ability to fight disease, which is quite concerning. According to the British Association of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons, research is now being planned to see if the treatment affects the risk of diseases, including cancer. And as a reminder, just because something's being studied doesn't mean you immediately have to run out and get all of your fillers dissolved. People don't need to panic and have fillers dissolved as an emergency. This is preliminary research, but it gives us a scientific explanation for side effects we are seeing with fillers. Whether it has more medical ramifications is unknown at this stage. However, this does highlight the importance of using a medically trained clinician for injectable fillers. In terms of the shift in culture, I've already seen that celebrities are using less and less filler, but are seeming to get more and more facelifts at a very young age. And so I can assume that that's only going to continue being the trend, um, not just with celebrities, but also just with people in general. 70% of surgeons had observed a trend of younger patients under 50 inquiring about facelifts. So it does seem like the pillow face trend is hopefully on its way out. And the last trend is one that I arguably feel the most passionate about. It just makes me want to throw my computer out the window and scream into the abyss. It's the TikTok trend of obsessing over facial harmony. It's basically all about balance. So facial harmony is the idea that a person's facial features should complement each other to create a balanced and aesthetically pleasing appearance. But TikTokers, of course, really took this idea and ran with it and turned it into yet another reason to obsessively overanalyze our features and make us insecure. If you aren't familiar, it's a trend that sees TikTok users taking close-up footage of their facial features, their nose, eyes, jawline, and mouth, and then zooming out to see if their features work together to create good or bad facial harmony. The idea is that people can have perfect features but bad overall facial harmony and vice versa. Sometimes the comments are really nice and they're just lifting the creator up and they're telling them how beautiful they are, but sometimes people are absolutely brutal and just pick apart every single feature on someone's face. This seems like yet another trend for people who are kind of seeking validation of their hotness and are making other people feel bad about themselves, whether unintentionally or not. I think it's notable that these videos are typically created by conventionally attractive people, usually women, and the most viral one makes me want to pull my hair out. That makes me question if that TikTok was just intentional rage bait to get engagement because that video has 
4.8 million views. I mean, how are you supposed to feel if you're someone who does not have conventionally attractive features according to society, and you see these objectively stunning people humble bragging and looking for compliments? I mean, that can be really detrimental to someone's self-worth and their mental health, and that's why I stay very far away from that kind of content unless I'm researching a video. And it's a slippery slope. You know, you see these videos and you start wondering, hmm, do I have good features? Or do I have good facial harmony? Or do I have bad features? Do I have bad facial harmony? It's just, it's not healthy for us to hyperfixate on tearing apart our tiniest little flaws and constantly overanalyzing other people's faces. Dr. Edwina Morgan says, as a medical professional, this is yet another disturbing trend with little to no scientific merit. I'm struggling to find a rationale as to why this is a trend and why benefit can be derived from its practice. What ensues in the comment section is even more disturbing with strangers posting cruel and depreciating commentary. I know that I'm repetitive about this, but I'm really drawn to faces that have character and something unique about them that don't just have perfect features and perfect harmony. Beauty is subjective, it's individual, and it relies on context, meaning a feature that someone thinks is a flaw could be seen as an attractive trait for someone else. I'm sure that trends like facial harmony and iPhone face are doing serious damage, especially on young people and especially on young women. Plastic surgeons have reported a significant increase in patients wanting procedures based on social media trends. And you have to remember, a trend is just that. It's something that is fleeting and changes rapidly. Dr. Edwina says, there's beauty in imperfection, in asymmetry, in the subtle genetic nuances that make us individuals. Take this TikTok, for example. Y'all might as well go home cause I just fucking nailed that. Yes, she's absolutely conventionally attractive, but I think what makes her extra hot is her imperfect teeth. In my opinion, she's the hottest person in this whole video. If she fixed her teeth or got veneers, all that character would just disappear. Beauty and attractiveness is not just about the features. It's the whole picture. And I don't think it's enough to tell people that. They really have to believe it. And social media isn't going to be regulated anytime soon, so it's important that we click not interested when we see those types of videos and we limit our screen time. I mean, touch grass, respectfully, for your mental health. I'll leave a video on the screen if you wanna keep watching my content. And I'd love to hear from you. What are some of the trends you've seen in 2024 that you feel passionately about, whether they have longevity or whether there's something that you'd really like to see disappear? And in the meantime, I hope you'll enjoy this video of my dog Thumper enjoying an afternoon nap.